You're listening to Radio Kidnappers, the voice of Hawke's Bay. This is a program called Instant Zone Peak Performance Every Day. And it's our pleasure for the first time this year to have in the studio Edmund Otis. How are you going, Edmund? Happy New Year to you. You too, Ken. Happy New Year. I'm doing great. That's good. Now, today we're going to talk about how to really solve problems and achieve goals without a lot of drama. And I was just talking to... Uh, to Jill, uh, my offside here at Kidnappers, and I said, oh, look, I've got to talk to Edmund about this. And I said, often when we talk to Edmund, it's so easy to read <laughs> about it and easy to talk about it. But yeah, how do we really solve problems and achieve goals without dramas? Well, well there's a couple. There's a couple of things trapped in there, and, and 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 I want to keep reminding you and myself, <laughs> it isn't easy. It's simple. Yeah, yeah. But that's the big difference. <laughs> things that are simple are often not easy. Dead right, they're not. Um, you know, and, and there's, a, there's a couple of things packed into that title. One of it is, you know, a lot of us, and there's nothing wrong with this, a lot of us like drama. Yeah, you dead know, wrong, we live uh, on it. We, we enjoy it, it gives us something to do, it gives us purpose, it gives us urgency. But, and sometimes that drama or the intensity, it works well if it motivates us to make some changes. Or we need to recognize, you know, I'm just someone who likes to be upset all the time. Yeah. And we know there are people like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, unfortunately, the people who like to be upset all the time also tend to like to make other people upset all the time. Yeah. That becomes a problem. Um, you know, as, as we've talked about all the time, you know, a lot of what I do comes out of sports psychology. Um, and s the business of sports psychology is all about resolving problems. And the re problems you resolve is how do I run faster, jump higher, knock somebody out? How do I get my team to win the regionals? Yeah. How do I get my team to win the nationals? That's a problem. And a lot of that, what we look at, is especially with sport, is it's goal oriented. Yeah. And my big thing when I work with clients, or you know, when I think about it for myself, is we try to come up with a point. If you can, especially when you're really upset, okay, what is a goal? What would be my goal? Yeah. And that tends to help. It's a big difference, though, isn't it? Sorting out a physical problem uh, like, say, sports related, where you know you want to get faster, stronger that sort of thing, that's completely different to a psychological problem though, isn't it? Well, yes and no. But we have to remember that, you know, when we look at sport, and I, I keep thinking about your listeners who aren't actually into sport, but I, I think there's relevance. When we look at sport, you know, the faster, the stronger, and all that are just tools. The point of sport is being able to perform well when you don't know what the outcome is. It's all psychological. Yeah. You know, as a lot of my colleagues argue with me about, you know, you can be as strong as you want, but Okay, well, how well you perform when you need to. You know, you look at the tennis that's going on in uh, Australia right yeah. now. Brilliant, brilliant athletes, beautiful athletes. But they don't know what's going to happen until that game. So, you know, it's, for me, it's impossible mm. to separate that psychological from the tools. Sure. But I want to just want to take back a little bit. And we did talk about it last year or might have been the year before, I forget. And that is we all know people who, if there are 100 things happening and 99 of them are good, they will always focus on the one thing that isn't good. Yes. How do you solve that problem with people? I mean, that, that's a problem which we, we all know someone like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question, first of all, is that actually a problem for them, right? Some people just like that. You know, we, we have personality. Uh, I'm not sure that's a problem for them unless it creates a lot of unhappiness for them. I mean, that just may be a problem for us. We know somebody like that. You know, maybe I have, you know, my brother's like that. He has all these wonderful things going on, and he just focuses on the negative because mm -hmm. he's worried about something. Yeah. Maybe that isn't his problem. Maybe it's my problem that it bothers me. I'm happy to let him do that. Yeah. But normally those people bring people down. Oh, they do. Don't yeah. they? Yeah. So uh, one of my notes that I uh, made before you came along is that first of all, we need to analyze the cause of the problem. How easy is that? No. Again, a little disagreement. I'm not sure we need to analyze the cause of the problem. We need to analyze what would resolve the problem. So we don't need to um, fix the cause of it? Well, you, you may fix the cause on the way, but we say analyze. A lot of people think about it too much. I'm, I'm in a relationship that I'm unhappy, and we argue, and we argue. Why is that? We argue, we argue, no matter what we do. It turns out that that's just our personalities. The question I want to ask myself is, do I want to stay in this kind of relationship? Right? I'm in a job that I despise. I hate it every day I go to work. Well, is the problem the job? Or maybe the question is, would I like to change the situation? Well, you know, a lot of analyzing, again, to me, analyzing is like drama. Analyzing is yeah. okay, but most of us know what's up. You know, do I want to change what I'm experiencing? Yes. And that is a sixty-four thousand dollar question, know it. isn't it? You know yes. it, and that's when you come and you say, "Well, it's so simple, <laughs> but it's not easy." <laughs> but yes. it's not easy. That's right. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of things we can do, right? One of the things we want to do, and again, I make I make it sound simple, 
is, you know, establishing a goal, you know, and the goal is not, I want to be happy. Yeah. Okay. The goal is, you know, if I was happy, what would I do? So we establish a goal and the goal is not, I want to change this, but what would I prefer to have? You know, it's not a problem of, I hate where I live. The problem is, or the question is, where would I rather live? It's not a problem, I hate my job. The question is, what would I rather be doing? Now, you know, so that goes back to what we think of as stress. And one, one of the things we look at is, I, I look in terms, and I probably mentioned this before, either front load stress or rear load stress, right? Front load stress is you do what you need to do to change your situation so you are actually happier. Rear load stress is you just endure it over and over again, but there's a lot of options, right? For some people, front load stress uh, means that you don't get to change something, but to be honest, for some of us, front load stress just means I'm going to accept where I am. There's a big difference, and now it's all like Zen and meditative, yeah. okay, which you are a proponent of, right? You, you meditate all the time. Every morning I every, meditate. Every morning, sometimes at night, <laughs> exactly. But you probably do meditate. I do meditate, you meditate a little yeah. bit. Yeah, well, yeah, who's, who's, got, who's got time to meditate? That's a whole other subject. <laughs> but, but however, you know, there's a big difference between accepting the way something is and putting up with it. I wonder though, that's a good point that you raise, um, and we, we have talked about it before, but as we come to a new year 2020 and your last program was all about change, yes. why do 95% of people fall over with resolutions or change? Because I, I might be being pessimistic with that figure of 95%, but yeah. it would seem to be that everyone who makes a new year's resolution or decide to change in one way or another, they, they fall over. Why do they fall over? Because you're saying it's simple, but it's difficult. But why, why does it happen? Yeah, um, I think we, we think more of the change, more of the outcome. I don't think we identify well enough what we want our outcome to be. Uh, you know, I, I've got to change my diet. Well, maybe I just want to be healthier. Yeah. Uh, and for a lot of people, it, it's a difficult struggle. I think a lot of us, especially nowadays, one of the things I'm seeing, you know, with the internet and with all this is we tend to experience and expect more and more instantaneous change. Yeah. Just because things happen quickly. Okay, we think it's going to be easy. Um, there's this great old theory. I, I always forget the guy who, um, who um, thought it up. But it's how change works. It was developed through sports psychology and team functioning. And from then it's been taken into organizations and corporations. And it uses four, four letters to describe it. And I, it's FSNP. Anytime you have change, okay, you have S FSNP. The F stands for forming. We have an idea of what it's going to be like. The S stands for struggling. We have to recognize that it's going to be hard to get there. Okay, the N stands for normalizing. We need to give ourselves enough time that that new pattern becomes normal. Mm -hmm. And then we get to performing. Most of us get frustrated. We, we, if, if anything we have, and you know, that I think the thing we're having the most challenge with is people have a lower and lower tolerance for frustration. Yeah. We're not good anymore, or if we ever were, but we're not good anymore at going through that struggling period of being a little bit uncomfortable while new patterns take over. Mm. And, that, that's the, and that's why none of the resolutions last. I did read somewhere, though, that it only takes three weeks for uh, a change to become a habit. That's not true, though, is it? I think it's longer than that. I think there is something to that. That, that is that FSMP. I think three weeks is awfully quick. Mm -hmm. um, some people say you need to perform an action several thousand times. Uh, from what I've heard it, the, everybody has a little different thing, right? Maybe yours is just faster. From what I've heard it, six weeks to six months. Yeah, okay. Okay, when you stop doing the same old stuff, right? All we're talking about is habits. Yeah. How to solve, a, how to really solve problems, uh, and like I say, you make it sound easy. When I was reading uh, this article to talk to you about it, uh, it uses sort of jargon, which I'm sure you'll understand this <laughs> next one, and that is generate alternative interventions. Well, for the average Joe Blow, including nothing, what the heck does that mean? But obviously it's a part of how we really solve problems. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> it means give. You, I, I assume it means give yourselves options. Okay, here's here's what I think we should do, and here's what I encourage my clients to do. Uh, I encourage my clients, and um, and I, I think of it in the same way I think of a map or I think of a GPS, and I use this all the time. I've spoken about this. I use it with my clients. All that we figure out what our what we would like our goal to be. You know, maybe I want to lose weight, so I want to be 10 kilos. Uh, lighter. Maybe I want to change my job. So I figure out the go what the goal might be. Everybody gets all distracted all over the place. The next thing I got to do is ask myself, what's the first thing I should do? That's all. People who do that, and this is based on research, people who do that have a much 
better likelihood and much better statistical chance of changing those behaviors. Okay, and it's the same thing, you know, you and I have talked about, you do with a map. You open up a map, I want to go to Wellington, that's great, big map, or you open up this GPS, I want to go to Wellington. But the first thing I need to do is go to the corner and turn right. It isn't, oh, it's a yeah, long way, sure. or, oh, it's going to be great, or oh, Wellington is beautiful. No. People who tend, and I'm talking about people, I'm talking about individuals, I'm talking about teams and groups, do a really good job of figuring out, for God's sake, what do I need to do first? Because that puts you one step closer to your goal. Reality. So maybe that's an alternative yeah, intervention. That's, <laughs> that's uh, but I think what you find is that the reality of anything in life is completely different to what we're talking about now, what I read in this book. And I was particularly interested in a, in a, uh, a picture I saw on, on the web a couple of days ago. I thought, yeah, I must talk to Evan about this because it was some guy with a beer belly. And uh, right next to the picture of him with the beer belly was the same guy, completely ripped muscles, you know, and he said, you know, lost 30 pounds, went cool. to the gym, and he thought, wow, yes. that's me. Yes. That's not me, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're ripped already. <laughs> Highly unlikely. But you know what I mean? That they think, okay, well, yeah, I can do that. But the reality of that is imagine the amount of work that it took that guy to get those abs completely unrealistic. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want, well, yeah, it's unrealistic yeah. for most. Yeah. But I don't, I don't want to imagine that. I want to imagine what he did first. First thing he did is he went to the gym. That's good. And once he got to the gym, he talked to somebody who said, you know, I'd like to get in better shape. And the guy said, come in Tuesday. And he went in Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you know, you know how corny is this or how, you know, um, old-fashioned is this, but it's that journey of a thousand step yeah, thing. that's right. People get too over, oh, I'm never going to lose that. How am I going to lose that much weight? Look, it doesn't matter. Nobody, nobody does anything. Well, they're doing the very first thing. Yeah. But I think that's why 95% of the people fall over because yes. it all looks so simple. Here's a guy with a beer belly. Here's a photo of him three months, six months later. Wow, does he look great? But they imagine the amount of work that Incredible went into amount of that. Work. Yes, yes. You know, so uh, how do we implement and plan? Um, well, first of all, you set a reasonable goal. Is it reasonable if I've worked 30 hours, you know, 20 hours a week? Or 20 hours a day for the last 10 years. I just eat fast food. You know, I, I drink too much beer. I work where I'm in terrible shape. For me to decide in six weeks I'm going to be cut. No. Yeah. First of all, you, you implement a reasonable goal. I would like to be in better shape. Okay. I would like to lose 10 kilos. That's the first step. The second is literally, again, literally this. In order to do that, what do I need to do first? Yeah. And then I do that. And then what do I need to do next? Then I do that. It's all, it's all a roadmap. You know, I wonder, I, yeah, like you're a story in itself. I mean, here you are, you're a, a black belt yeah. in karate. Yeah. Uh, how, how many black belts or above black belt are you? Uh, I'm an um, eighth degree black belt. Yeah. Wow. So, but I've been practicing for 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> since I was little. Yeah. Yes, you have. And that leads me to my next question. I mean, uh, how, how far away are you from being the ultimate in karate? Uh, in, in the form of belts. Yeah. So your eighth is a 10, is it the highest? Yeah, th there's a 10. We usually do that when you die, so yeah. we'll see. <laughs> um, there's probably about another 10 years. Uh, the, more you the more you go up in rank. Uh, but it isn't that, you know, I'm that much better than everybody else, but I have more responsibility. You know, it, it's about recognizing your contribution. Um, but again, this is something that I do simply because I love it. I've always done this. I don't, I don't think there's been two weeks in my in the last 52 years that yeah. I've been practicing karate. But nobody's made me, well, they used to make me do it when I was on the team. Yeah. You know, come to my house, knock on the door, drag me to the dojo. But now it's just something I do. But yeah. I wonder, do you have to be a bit anal or a bit fanatical about something to, to get to that level where you are? What have you sacrificed along the way, perhaps, that you might, I'm not saying you might have enjoyed more, but have you sacrificed things along the way where you thought, hey, that'd be great, I'd love to be ch chilling out with those guys, but you were so focused on becoming that black belt or this eighth Dan, that you missed out on a bit of life? I get Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think sacrifice is the right word. I think you make choices. Mm. Sacrifice, right? choice, same thing. No, that? no, not at all. Sacrifice is you do some, I mean, some, and sometimes I'm, I believe that, you know, you make the choice to make a sacrifice. So sacrifice is for good. But, you know, the way you talk about sacrifice, did I waste my time? Um, I think that people who focus on something and love what they're doing, they make choices. Yeah. You can't do everything. Oh, no, I don't think it was a waste of time. But yeah. you, didn't your wife ever say, geez, you're going down to the gym again? 
No, I, she did say a long time ago when I was we were doing the whole political karate stuff because there's <laughs> politics everywhere. Yeah. She did say, "Oh my, for God's sake, it's just karate." That yeah. seemed to help me. No, I mean it's 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 what I do. I mean I could have done other stuff. I, I don't know how to ski. Yeah, you know I think I'd like to ski. I've never done that. I can't fly a plane. So this is a choice I made. Something I did. But you can't do everything. No, you, you got to figure out what what satisfies you. For me, for the karate is uh, there's a transitional process. You know, I started out as a student and didn't know anything, and gradually as I got better, you assume more responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I remember I liked both of those. I, li I like being a follower, but I also am very comfortable leading. Did it take you over there? Did, it, I, I would have to presume that someone yes. in your position would have had to take for, over your life. For many years when I was competing internationally, uh, it was my entire existence. But that's just like being a professional athlete. Yeah. I was on the U.S. national karate team for a little over 10 years. Then I was U.S. national coach. And like all sport, I mean, it's consuming enough. You know, if you're in an involved in an activity where you absolutely have to be your best or as good as you possibly can be, by definition, it does take over your life. Was it your day job? It was my day job. It was my night job. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was fortunate. I, uh, I got to teach, but I also got to train. Um, and because I'd started young enough, uh, it was almost everything I did for a long time. And then after I stopped competing, I was uh, teaching at... Um, a university as a coach and um, then I decided to go back to graduate school because then I became interested in being a better motivator you know I mean for those of you know if we know athletes are combat there's nothing as selfish and self-centered as professional athletes in a good way I don't mean that bad yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about you uh, but then I became interested in motivating people from that's the point I went back to graduate school yeah. for psychology is it a problem for you, not just necessarily you in particular, but is it a problem and how do you solve the problem of coming down from where you're at? I mean, you're an eighth Dan, and I guess if you didn't train for a year, you'd probably just be like a regular black belt, but <laughs> how, how hard is it for high-performance athletes like yourself to come down? It's, it's, it's a challenge for several. I mean, at some point, uh, I think what I was lucky about is I transitioned from... Uh, intense competition to coaching, my purpose changed. Okay, I, I work with athletes now who are retired athletes, and they're, for a lot of them it's a considerable problem. You know, they're the center, they focus, they're all, they, you know, they're absolutely involved, and then their career is over, and then what do we do with that? That becomes a problem. I, I was real lucky in that, or thoughtful. I decided I like the environment enough that I change. You see, but it, the, again, you see a lot of athletes who become coaches. Yeah. Okay. You see a lot of coaches become administrators, you know, so you stay involved. But for a lot of, for, but for everybody, you know, you have, you go through an intense period and that, that changes. People have a hard time transitioning. Yeah. Okay. Without deciding what else you would like to do or what kind of person do you want to be. Do you still compete? No, no. Right. When did you stop competing? Uh, I stopped competing when I was 33. Why did you do that? Because some people at your age, I'm not saying that you're that old, yeah. but they still compete. And, uh, and I wonder, is it hard to let go because you were good at something and then you've got a problem letting it go because you think, well, it's sort of almost like an expectation that you're going to be good for the rest of your life, whereas sometimes you've got to say, well, I'm getting a bit old for this. Well, um, I, I think one of the things that happened is I stopped competing because my teaching took over. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I mean, to, to compete at, in my sport and at an elite level, uh, where you talk about reaction time and rhythm. And again, yeah. you know, at 33, competing against 24-year-olds sure. who may not have the experience, but they have more, you know, fast, fast twitch, yeah. fastest muscle and reaction time and all that. There's a change. But what I did, I started competing in the sense that I started coaching. And so I had a long career for that. But um, a, lot of people, a lot of people still compete. I, I didn't actually want to compete in the seniors division or masters division, or, although there is a big tournament yeah. in, uh, in Japan and that it's for 60 year olds and above yeah and myself and some mates are thinking about doing that but i don't think i'm going to do it <laughs> why not <laughs> no desire but however it isn't to say that i don't train i'm, I'm on the floor a lot i mean I, yeah. I work out a lot of course is it a problem when you get to a certain age where you decided to give up competing uh, because not that you use that as an excuse yeah, yeah. of becoming a coach but yeah. Is it hard to make that decision when you think, well, wow, wow, I used to be really good, but no, now I'm no, a bit slower. And no, geez, no, no, you know, I'm still really good. How do you I, get your head think, around that as well, though? It isn't so much getting around it. I, I think what, what, what happens is, you know, you talked about sacrifice. You know, I made other choices. At some point, I wanted to do other things. You know, I was interested in going back to school. Um, I got married. I was interested in having a family. And... I just kind of re readjusted my priorities. I was lucky that stayed with it. But again, I took, you know, like I do now. Mm. I mean, I took a lot of what I did, the experience from that, and I transitioned it into other 
things. I mean, what I've, one of the things I was lucky at is I, I, even when I was competing, I always had a club I always taught. So I'm interested in working with people to, you know, as silly as it sounds, I'm interested in working people to help them achieve goals. And so I kind of I, I transition that way. Sometimes you go, whew, I'm glad I don't have to work out every day. It's, yeah. You, know, it's the, you get to say, well, and I guess this goes with every career, not just uh, uh, a sportsman like yourself, but in a lot of careers, they have to be peak performance every day. And sometimes yes. you could say, wow, thank God I walked away from that. Yeah, I mean, of, of course. But uh, again, but mostly what I did is I, I, I think I transitioned from trying to go as best I can there to leveraging that, and now I do it in, in other ways. You know, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy there are days that I don't have to compete every day, all day. So. Do, you have, do you have regrets about giving up too early or I'm good. not looking at fighting in the Masters? Do you think? No, I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty content with all of it, which may be my problem, of course. Because you've really, you've really solved the problem, <laughs> haven't you? I guess. Well, I just decided I don't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Although you bring all these things up, and I can absolutely guarantee you when we're off the radio, I'm not going to give this any thought. I'm still good. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So did you achieve all your goals without a lot of drama? Um, or did you, when you finished, you think, oh, I just can't compete anymore because I've lost my edge or whatever, or you're going into... Uh, sometimes just, when you set a goal, you, you don't achieve it, and is it easy to let go? Well, you know, I... I think what I did is I just decided it was time to transition to something else. Mm. You know, I, I was real happy. I, I had done real well, um, national championships and all that. And then as a coach, I did real well. I, I developed some really, really brilliant champions who are also teaching now. Uh, two of my students are U.S. national coaches at the current time. Uh, and I go back and teach all the time. But I, I think it was, just, it was just a time. It's like, you know, at what point do you stop being single and start yeah. having a family? Yeah. You know, what point do you stop being a student and start doing this? So I, I think it was just, I, I've been real fortunate. I think I moved towards something. There's a real interesting little quirky theory about motivation. And I, I believe this a lot. Some people are motivated by what, what they call avoidance. And some people are motivated by acquisition. Right? And I work with clients all the time with this. And avoidance means you're, you're motivated to do something because you don't like what's happening. You avoid discomfort. Mm. Acquisition means you move towards something, right? Mm -hmm. So it's pleasure or pain. Yeah. Um, thinking right now, although I haven't given it much thought before, I think I'm fortunate in the sense that what motivates me is moving towards something. I, I'm not really conscious ever that you know, I'm moving away from something. Mm. Um, so th that seems to work for me. It isn't that I was unhappy doing something. I wanted to transition and do something else. But both, you know, both those motivational. Uh, theories of motiva uh, those motivations are, are valid. People are just different. But some people only change because, God, I really hate this. I don't like it. I want to do something else. Well, I was fortunate. I liked what I did, but I decided, you know, maybe I'm going to try something else. Yeah. And I guess uh, you have the advantage of, in your head, in, in your job, you can cope with that very well. Because you've been, that's, that's what you do for a yeah, job. That's what you I know? do. And also, you know, to be really honest, I don't see what I do is much different. You know, I, I, have a, I was at the University of California for a long time before I moved to New Zealand. Uh, I was in humanities where I got to teach in psychology and physical education and athletics. So we did a lot of that kind of stuff there. Um, I'm a lecturer at EIT where I do sports psychology, so I'm real delighted with that. I kind of see almost everything I do. I'm real fortunate as being an aspect of the same thing. You know, when, when I work with um, athletes, it's the same as when we develop programs in schools. You know, what can I do to help people move in a direction they want to move in? Yeah. Do you ever worry that you're going to be running out of juice or people might look at you and say, mm, he's pretty old, you know, it's, it's all about young. And do you worry about that or do you think at that time, well, I'll just move on to something else? Well, because that's a now. problem with people, isn't it? That if you've been I in your job and you, you think... You know, I, I think, you know, if you stop having purpose, you'll find out pretty quickly. Mm. You know, if, if I felt that I didn't have an opportunity, you know, where I could make a contribution, it isn't what I would think. It's, you know, people yeah, stop asking me to. Exactly. It's hard though, isn't it? Maybe. You sort of like, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. I'm, yeah, I seem to be busy right. so you're far. You're still but, in. But we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> good on you, Edmund. As yeah. always, it's been our pleasure to talk with you. You look after yourself. We'll talk to the same time, same place next time. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Ken.